I'm happy to present Jason Fletcher. Jason is a professor of public affairs with appointments in sociology, agriculture, and applied economics and population health sciences, as well as the director of the Center for Demo Demography great, on Health and Aging at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to becoming, coming to the UW in 2013, he held appointments at Yale and Columbia University and has covered over 100 academic articles, published, sorry, a health economic economist by training. He has worked to integrate genetics and social science over the past decade, culminating in his book, The Geno Factor. Please help me welcome Jason Fletcher. Thank you, Amanda and Roberta. Those were just warm welcomes, and I love this type of talk. I've given many, and they're all, they always, uh, all these discussions always bring up really interesting and new questions, so I look forward to that. But before we do that, I have to talk for a little while, so that's what I'll do first. I want to um, I want to thank um, Senator Herb Cole, who gave a gift to the La Follette School a few years ago to do exactly this outreach to the state, take the ideas um, from all the um, institutions in the state and spread them around, spread around the Wisconsin idea to all corners of the state. And so, so tonight I want to outline some of the advances coming from the genomic revolution and highlight how these advances have resurfaced uh, critical questions on law, policy, and ethics around privacy, discrimination, and human flourishing. So that's a lot. Um, so I want to take us all the way to the end in some, in some way. Oh like that, which is to say, um, here we are. This is uh, 15 years, the last 15 years, there have been over 90,000 new findings in the human genome linking specific variants to disease. And the NIH updates this catalog um, monthly because of the fast pace. So this is, this is taken from over 4,000 publications in the last 10 years. And what you're seeing are human chromosomes with little dots next to them where in each dot is a distinct finding related, relating a human genetic variant to an outcome. An outcome could be cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, height, and, and so on. So there's been a lot of uh, rapid progress in genetic discovery. Um, so that this is a part of the genetics revolution, the genomics revolution I'm going to describe. And I come to this having spent some time with a colleague, uh, Dalton Conley, who's a PhD in sociology and a PhD in biology, um, recent PhD in biology, um, after being the dean at, at NYU. Um, he did that, you know, during the evenings. And we, we've reflected back on the last 10 or 15 years of integration of these genetic findings into the social sciences, the social sciences being economics, political science, sociology, and, other, and many others. And this book was published uh, two years ago, which now, unfortunately for us, means it's, it's in the history section of the library. I noticed that it's in this library, too, and, and checked out, so I appreciate that. Um, but it's, it's, it's dated. This was published two years ago. And what we realize now is that our speculations on the faraway future, what's going to happen in 20 years, have, have already happened. We're, we were way uh, uh, too modest. Well, we, 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 uh, we, we thought we were talking about the future, but we were talking about the present. And we really didn't spend a lot of time. The other regret of ours is not spending a lot of time on policy. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today is, a, is, a little, is to frame it around a call to action, a needed call to action, a call to action that was needed 10 years ago to anticipate these, uh, the set of findings I'm going to describe and, and the rapidity of these findings um, in policy domains and how, and how these findings are going to um, necessitate or generate new policies and new thinking about how um, these genetic findings work in our lives. So let me start off uh, by reminding us about a few genetic facts that we'll want to take with you through the, through the talk. So I only have a few slides. There's a couple of facts I want to uh, remind you of. One is the, um, the amount of content we're talking about when we talk about the human genome. So it's three billion 
little bits of information. I'm going to call them letters throughout, more technically nucleotides. But this, this is what's undergirding the spiral staircase of the DNA structure, which, which if you squint, you'll see A's and C's and T's and G's, and those are the letters I'm going to describe. But there's three billion pairs of them. There's about 1.5 billion miles of DNA in your body. There's three th that's 3,000 round trips to the moon. So there's a lot of content. So it's fact one, lots of information. Fact two, uh, a lot of this information is exactly the same in all humans forever and ever. So n over 99.5% of all these letters are identical for all humans. So uh, look around, a lot of common humanity um, in, 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 in the DNA. Uh, comma, 98% uh, of the letters found in the human DNA, the human genome, are identical to chimps. That then makes us recall or makes, makes a point that some of these differences, although there's almost, although we're very similar, almost completely so, that, that where there are differences, some of those differences can really matter. Okay, so one example, where else we'd be chumps, right? Um, so just as an example, a clarifying example, you see some letters here, C's and A's and T's and G's, so if you have three billion pairs and you zoomed in, to 20 of them, and you read C's and A's and T's and G's in normal cells, and then you come down to this line and you see all the same C's and A's and T's and G's except for one. And that one difference among these two people uh, decide genetically whether you have normal blood cells or sickle cells. So that's an example where of the point, which is that some of these letters really matter. That's one example of a letter that really matters to human lives. The, the final point, and then I'll move on from genetics, and this, you'll see an asterisk here, um, um, anticipating maybe some of the Q&A about gene editing. But before we get to gene editing in humans, we should, I think, in, in the, for the purposes of this conversation, I want us to at least believe for the moment that these um, letters that, I'm, that I'll be describing are permanent in your lifetime. You had the same letters that you have now if you were genotyped. You had the same letters when you were an embryo. You'll have the same letters your whole life. You'll have the same letters when you die. That's what I mean by permanent. Um, and again, asterisk, we can get to gene editing later. For most of human history, they're permanent. Okay, so genetic facts, those, that's what I just described. I wanna now build up a revolution Nothing I've said so far is revolutionary. Those are the facts that have always been true. So the revolution actually comes from two aspects. One is technological improvements in measuring these facts. And the second one is what is done with these measurements, meaning the amassing of in enormous data sets of human DNA and the application of statistical algorithms to find new discoveries. So those are going to be the two features that in combination I'm going to uh, de descri describe a revolution. And the implication of that, and that's what the call it action is, is that when you have such a dramatic technological improvement and the, app and the use of statistical um, applications on those improvements, there's, there are many new policy questions that should have been decided or at least discussed 10 years ago. So we're, we're way behind, and that's the call to action part. But it's still, I think it's a reasonable and will generate a good discussion, I hope, today, which is what to do with, all, with this revolution. So what are the improvements, the technological improvements? So that's my first claim. That to have this revolution, I need to defend the claim that there's been uh, important technological improvements. Okay. So I'm not there yet. I'm reminding us all that in your daily lives, as you've lived your life, you'll notice, you would have noticed that prices change over, this, over the last two decades. And in fact, you will, would not be surprised to know that college tuition fees are among one of, the bundle, one of the items we buy that has changed the most over the last 20 years. So go back to 1997, uh, center, uh, that's your starting point for college tuition and fees, that, um, amount, that the price uh, paid has increased by 150% over two decades. That's, that's a lot, right? College tuition and fees is in the news a lot about being, uh, in terms of its uh, um, price changes over time. Education more generally is an area of our lives where we've experienced price changes. 
child care, Medicare, medical care. I'm just reminding you of what you already know to be true and have had experience, but, I'm, but, um, but you'll see where I'm going in just a minute. Uh, so these are prices that have increased. We've also had experiences in the recent past, in the last 25 years, 20 years, where some of the things we buy have gotten a lot cheaper for what you get for them. So television is, is the prime example here that over the last 20 years has declined in price by like 90% for what you get. If you go back to the first big screen TVs and how much they were, thousands and thousands of dollars, and they weren't that great, now they're hundreds of dollars and they're much better. That's the idea. Okay, so that's, this is all normal in our, that we've experienced in our lives. Now, let me move to something that's totally unprecedented, which is the, which is the price for um, sequence in human DNA. Over the same period of time, the last 20 years, the cost per human genome sequencing has fallen uh, on this scale. So this is now totally differently scaled, um, where the slow line is Moore's law, which is computational capacity doubling every 18 to 20 months. So how much you pay for a computer and what you get for it. That's, that, this, uh, this phenomenon called Moore's law from the 60s has been true for a long time and is itself unprecedented until what I'm about to tell you. Um, so that's, this is really fast. Computers have gotten really cheap. Uh, per dollar spent, the computational power is, is, is quite impressive, doubling every 18 months to two years. Okay, that's Moore's Law. This line is the cost per human genome over the last 20 years up until almost present. And, and this line shows a reduction in price of 100 million times. So what, used to, what, what cost 20 years ago... Um, hundreds of millions of dollars to sequence one person's uh, genome now, now being here, is in the $500 to $100 range where the projections are $50 by the next couple years. So going from $100 million to $50 over the same period of time as uh, this last slide is what I mean by unprecedented. Okay, so there's going to be some implications for that uh, rapid change over time. And one implication, and I'll read some of this if you can't uh, see the, the, the type, um, is that there have been private companies, uh, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA are the ones I've listed. Those are the four biggest private companies that are genotyping individuals. You can see some growth patterns um, on this slide. So 2015, 23andMe had about 800,000 uh, genotype samples. Fast forward a couple years, 2 million. Last year in August, five million. Now nine million. Um, Ancestry DNA is at even more rapid increase. So they went from seven million in August of last year, in three months' time, doubled to fourteen million. This is the upstart. It went from zero a year and a half ago to two and a half million. And this 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 one's founder is, is floundering. Um, of only going from 900,000 to 2 million over the course of a couple years. So these are four private companies. Um, I list here, they had a sale in Thanksgiving 2017, and over the weekend sold 1.5 million DNA tests. They haven't released the numbers for last Thanksgiving, but it was on that order. And so here's a recent, as of two months ago, and now that more than 26 million people have taken an at-home DNA test. Here's the growth. And then I pulled one of the quotes. If the pace continues, the, uh, this data set will be 100 million. These data sets combined will be 100 million people within 24 months. And this is all because it's so cheap. Let's just go back to this point about it being cheap. You can't do this if each test costs $10,000. You can if each test costs fifty. And the projection from an academic uh, paper uh, is, here's the quote, there's different assumptions one could make. Even the um, uh, slowest uh, increase over time says by 2025, they envision at least 100 million. The upper, limp, the upper projection, as of a couple of years ago, is 2 billion uh, g human, sequences, uh, genot uh, human sequences analyzed. Um, so, unprecedented. You know, I, I'm going to use that word quite a bit over the, on, on the technology and the amassing of, in this case, it's private data. 
there's a government version of this. Many governments across the world are enlisting their own research subjects. I've got a few. So in, um, in Iceland, it's everybody. Everybody's in one data set. So, you know, there's 300 people, 100,000 people on that island, and they're all in one data set. And there's uh, large collections in the mid, low to mid 100,000s in many, many countries, and in individual health systems like Vanderbilt um, and, uh, and this Emerge group. So it's gov government efforts. The uh, U.S. version of a government effort that's recent is called All of Us. The... Uh, the, uh, eventually, they'd like to have one million individuals contribute their DNA. Uh, Madison is one of the many sites, so there's an effort in Madison to be part of this All of Us initiative in precision medicine. You'll notice that one million is, is about a weekend of ancestry DNA sales. Um, it's going to take the federal government a lot longer than that to collect this information. Um, so that's the main point I want to make about technological improvements, and the, and the main implication is, is these reduced costs uh, allow very quickly, over a very short period of time, amassing of just enormous, unprecedented scales of human DNA in single data sets. Now, what would one do with these data sets that are now in the tens of millions of people? And the answer is um, analyze them, use, use uh, statistical methods to uh, comb through the genome of millions of people and and consider predictive analyses. Um, so, what's so? Let me. I'm going to describe a little bit of that next, which is the workhorse here. And and, uh, and I'm going to try to move quickly through the technical details. But the workhorse is uh, called a genome-wide association study, which is step one, huge data set. Step two, scan the whole data set point by point, location by location, and ask the question, if you have an A versus a C here, a G ver an A versus a T here, a G versus a C here, location by location, are you more likely to be X? High risk, are you more likely to have cardiovascular disease? Are you more likely to have Alzheimer's disease? Are you more likely to be tall versus short? Are you more likely to so on, so on, so on? And you do this um, hundreds of thousands or millions of times, you know, point by point across each chromosome. And what that leads to is just uh, um, a huge number of uh, potential findings to comb through. So that's what I'll describe briefly, which is you, when you have all these findings, you're going to visualize them because um, we're, you know, uh, it, it's difficult to comb through hundreds of thousands of findings and, and figure out what, what uh, the, main, the key results are. So here's an example, a uh, uh, cartoon of what, it, of one of, of what, an output of one of these genome-wide association studies are, which is called a Manhattan plot, and what, what you're looking for are tall buildings in Manhattan here. And when you see uh, areas way up here, you say, oh, there might be something in the genome that is a true genetic discovery on the outcome of interest. And then, so that's step one, is to scan uh, letter by letter all the way through all the chromosomes and ask, what about here, what about here, what about here? Is there a difference in, in, in genetic variance on the outcome? And then there's hundreds of thousands of findings. You're going, to, you're going to summarize those in some way, I'll describe it a little later, and then use them to predict the outcome out of samples. So you ask, if you have all these A's and C's and T's and G's, are you more likely to have Alzheimer's disease or less likely? And so on. So those are the two steps. Uh, Manhattan plot, visualize findings, and then use, and then push them all together in some summary way to get out of sample prediction. So that's what I'm going to uh, work through in a couple uh, few, in a couple steps. Okay. So for example, here's a genome-wide association study. The uh, the uh, outcome here is the inability to smell the distinct odor produced in the urine after eating asparagus. <laughs> In this case, when you, when you run hundreds of thousands of, find, of, of, of uh, analyses, you find nothing except one place. Okay, so this is the Manhattan plot with one huge skyscraper and then nothing else. You think of this as a relatively simple, straightforward genetic architecture of that outcome, the asparagus outcome. Okay, so that's hopefully give you a sense of what's behind this. So this is about as simple as it's going to get. One place, nowhere else is where it matters. And that's, this is going to be very unusual. 
usually, more usually you're going to find, so these are different allergy um, outcomes. So it's uh, peanut allergy, milk allergy, egg allergy. More, more likely when you do these uh, analyses, you're going to find a lot of buildings. The, the genetic architecture is quite complex in most of the outcomes that we think are important. So, and, and so there's not one site for peanut allergy. There are quite a few small, there are quite a few relatively large buildings in this Manhattan plot. And, um, and they're spread all over the genome. And th so that's going to be the more likely, this is the more typical uh, genome-wide association output, which is lots of buildings. And in fact, this is the workhorse from my first slide. There has been 4,000 of these studies that have together identified 90,000 buildings. Okay? And, and so that that quantity of findings means there's one, there's a new one every day. Because there's 4,000, it's been 10 years, it's like one a day. So the one that was, that came out, uh, are you getting, okay, here's the, here's the one from two days ago. Uh, this one was all the way in January, so it's old news. Uh, this, this one is as of uh, two days ago. So the outcome here is a uh, measure of mood instability, but it's the same thing. So you get an outcome, you scan the whole genome, and you see, in this case, a lot of tall buildings, um, m mostly throughout the whole genome. There's not huge areas in the genome where there's no tall buildings. There's still uh, genetically complicated architecture here. So, and so on and so forth. So I do want to get you, you've seen a couple of these Manhattan plots. In general, what you'll see is a lot of buildings, a lot of complicated genetics that go into most outcomes that we care about. Okay, so that's not so useful. <laughs> um, meaning all these buildings, there's a lot of complication. So how, so what's the actual next step? So let me refer you back to these pushing all the results together and give that a name, which is what happens is you summarize all these results and you push them all together in like a credit score. Um, and this, these are called polygenic scores and they look like this in the population. Some people are at very high risk for the outcome, some people are at very low risk and most people are in the middle. So, so most, almost all of them look like a, a bell curve. Um, and now, now we're talking about something that can be and is used in the clinic. Now we're talking about some, something that if you walk in and the uh, clinician pulls up their EPIC screen and says, you know, okay, I know your height and your weight and your blood pressure and, and so on, and I also see over here that you've been genotyped and you have a high score for um, cardiovascular risk. Okay, so now this is, can be and is used in the clinic, and this could be like a red light, green light thing, or it could be a number, just like your cholesterol has a number and above it, you're in a high risk and a low risk, same thing here. So now we're in the clinic with these uh, polygenic scores. So, so far, this is just regular genetics. I mean, it, it's fast moving, it's complicated, but um, nothing so far probably gives you a sense that there's a social genomics revolution, um, so I'm about to do that. But the two steps, again, in these kind of analyses are scan the whole genome, look for tall buildings, and then take all that information, smush it all together into a credit score, and then you can use that credit score in the clinic. Okay, so those, th those are the two steps. I'll entertain a question, right? I, I know this is a, this is, might uh, get me in trouble, but if there's a clarifying question especially, because if you don't, like if I've, if I've uh, uh, said something that was not so clear, it's going to be hard to, to keep following the rest of the talk. Yes, please. Where are these coming from? You said most of the, the private ones, most of the people are in the private ones. Are they doing this, or is it the government that's doing this? The answer is both. It's not either or, it's both and. And, and they're combining forces. There'll, there'll be government, quote unquote, government data sets combined with 23andMe. So those four agencies or companies that are doing that that you showed before, are they virtually doing the exact same thing? It doesn't matter which one you go with? The, um, let me, I'll get that back. So remind me to Q&A to give you a more precise answer there. But the, but the workhorse methods of, I'm gonna to try to find a genetic signal for something is the same across all the companies. Yeah. So how, do the, uh, how does the data on the health of an individual get linked to the DNA test? Great, so that, that's a great question. Um, so it depends. So for 23andMe, they give you surveys, and if you decide to um, answer them, then that's their data. If, if you're in the clinic, they could genotype you and also have your blood pressure, right? So 
So does the... So it depends is the, is the answer. So does the data set know which is self-reported and which is clinically reported? The, the investigator would and would want to be careful in those cases, definitely. But, but, and it is what it is in the sense that if I go back to this, so this is an example. This um, is 400,000 people in what's called the UK Biobank, which is a large survey of individuals. So this is all survey information of uh, indicators of mood instability. Um, and with four, almost with 363,000 people, I'm going to go letter by letter, bum, 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 and look for places where among these 365,000 people, um, if you have an A, you're more likely to indicate mood instability than a T, G, C, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, but, this, but this is an example of a survey. This is not. This is neither a private company like 23andMe, nor a health group. This is a um, government-funded survey in the UK. Okay. Relatively comfortable, I'm feeling, here now, so let's move on to um, the fun part. Social genomics. Okay. Here's a genome-wide association study for educational attainment. Uh, point, point two. This was two and a half years ago. So same thing. Uh, and this one published in the journal Nature uh, found 74 locations in the human genome where if you have an A versus a T or a C versus a G, you're more likely to go to college. And here's what the Manhattan plot looks like. Lots of tall buildings here. This doesn't look like the asparagus example where there's nothing in the genome. There's a lot of tall buildings here. And this is of 300,000 people. And like I said, this is two and a half years ago. So that's step one, GWAS. Um, uh, six months ago, Nature Genetics, another publication, got the new version of the so same thing, educational attainment, but now it's not 300,000 people, it's 1.1 million people. And now it's not 74 locations, it's 1,200 locations in the genome. But so the buildings have gotten bigger. Okay, so that's step one. Uh, genetic architecture of whether you go to college. Step two, uh, let's get a credit score. Now, you're not, going to the, you're not going to the clinic for this one. This one you can do in the privacy of your own home. It's because when you submit your DNA to 23andMe, they'll send it back to you. They'll send your A's and C's and T's and G's back to you. And you can upload that file to this place, among many others, and they'll send you your credit score for years of schooling. So there's a lot that just happened here in these two slides, right? We've converted from maybe our comfort area of health indicators to social indicators, like years of schooling, and we're no longer in the clinic. There's no touch from, the, from a clinician in any of this. You can send your DNA to 23andMe, private company, and you can upload it to this nonprofit site. This is from uh, NYU and Columbia, and they'll send you back your polygenic score. Why is the, and without being too technical, so I'm not, I'm very specific, but why is the 14 years not in the middle of the, which looks maybe to be a bell curve? That's you. You're not as uh, polygenically high okay. as the other one. So some people have high risk of going to college, and some people have low risk of going to college. Um, and and that's, that's the way it is. So, um, so let me do some variation on this theme. Uh, okay, so hopefully you're thinking about, oh, maybe we should have some policies about the use of these things. <laughs> um, so, so we'll get there. And so this is not an education score, but this is just a point to say, and this, and this date shows you that this is over um, a year and a half ago, which is that private companies now, no, no clinical... Uh, touch. This is a $199 to get um, through the mail your diagnosis for breast cancer. And here's a private company that I like to put up um, because it's going to, because if you send them your DNA, it's going unlike, to unlock your insights of nutrition, sounds fine, health, fitness, ancestry, even the wine you might prefer. <laughs> Spotify. We'll create a, day, a playlist based on your DNA. So there's one version, there's one set of policies about do we want any guardrails on private uh, companies in the use of DNA? Okay, so let me uh, 
summarize where, where I'm going to be going for the next uh, few minutes, which is the themes here are, one, the expansion of large-scale genetic examinations into both health and anything else, anything measurable. Your, your question about, like, where does the data come from? Anything on a survey, anything on a survey can, can be uh, analyzed exactly the same as years of schooling or um, cardiovascular risk, and there can be a polygenic score for it. Point two, theme two, decentralization of knowledge. This is no, there's no uh, guidance necessary here. There's no gatekeeper, uh, which we would traditionally think of maybe as the medical establishment or your clinician would be the gatekeeper of telling you uh, of both getting your biological sample, analyzing it, and telling you what it means. None of that is necessary anymore and was not necessary for years. This is not in the future that I'm describing. This is in the past. And then the policy question are under the umbrella of the allowance of new directions in discrimination, meaning what, what used to be group-based discrimination, discrimination based on age, based on sex, based on uh, race, ethnicity, and so on. Now is not, does not need to be group-based anymore. It can be personalized to you. What's your risk of Alzheimer's disease? So let me give you a couple examples. So there are two areas in your life that cannot discriminate against you, your health insurer and your employer. This is from the GINA Act from uh, George W. Bush in 2008, way back when it was really expensive to do this and so on, if you remember the graph, if you remember the initial figure. But nonetheless, this um, has survived for 10 years at almost was gutted by one of the repeal and replace of Obamacare about a year and a half ago by one vote. Uh, we had this almost destroyed. But there are two places and only two places in your life where there's a legal remedy for genetic discrimination, meaning that if an employer discriminates, it can be found to discriminate against you based on your genetics. They can be, you, can have, you have legal action and your health insurer. Now we should start filling in what I did not say, which is what about your long-term care insurance? What about your educational system? What about your criminal justice system? What about anything, like pick a, pick a name. It is not covered. This is the only thing that's covered. So policy question, what should be covered? Maybe a little bit more fun uh, is, um, what are the implications, let me take this up in the book a little bit, of of dating and marriage when genetics is so cheap. So we speculated, um, this was in 2017, where there could be web-based dating where you fill out surveys and you provide your eye color and whatever and here's your profile. Now, you know, it could, it's so simple to add polygenic scores for education or uh, Alzheimer's risk for that matter on your dating profile. And we thought, oh, that, this was pretty, and we got the same kind of uh, chuckles uh, two years ago when uh, we, just, we described that. And then, uh, then you look and say, well, uh, that was two years ago. Um, you know, there are, dating, there are dating services that do exactly this, and here's two of them. Um, and you know, there's no legal uh, um, remedy for being discriminated against if you have high Alzheimer's risk here as a 20-year-old. Now, something a little bit more serious, that was, that was the fun part of the show. <laughs> now, something a little bit more serious, which is, um, rem remember, that, you know, the reason I reminded you of the fact a long time ago, when we first started, that you have the same letters now that you did when you were a fetus, is now, let, let, let's, let's uh, think about that a little bit more. Um, what else might we actually want to predict about people, besides their schooling and so on, or besides their health and so on? Um, and, and, and what people might we want to target for these predictions. So um, in particular, what do you want to predict about your fetus or baby or young child? The letters are the same. The predictions are the same. You, you, you would have had the same polygenic score as a fetus as you do now. So some are easy, like some are really easy to detect. Um, others are pretty easy to, to predict, like height and weight adult height and weight, but what about other elements of these embryos' uh, future lives um, that we might want to predict? And uh, there's a question of, well, would parents ever want to know that? Um, here's the 1939 World's Fair uh, patent from Dr. Seuss, Lee Dr. Seuss, of his technology to 
form predictions of facial features of your children, which is you take a picture of mom, you take a picture of dad, and you overlay them. So this didn't work. This, this, was, a failed, this was a failed patent, or this was a failed invention. Too many girls with mustaches. Um, <laughs> that was then, 1939. But there was a, maybe a demand for this. And then uh, here's an example from by, to, by today. And by today, I mean two years ago. Um, so here's real faces versus faces predicted only based on A's and C's and T's and G's using technology from two years ago. And remember, this is a face that you would predict of a fetus because the letters are the same as if you are an adult now, you know, as an adult now. So here, you know, so here's the policy topic, the question of what forms of discrimination would we like to rule in versus rule out for future generations? We have the technology. It used to be that maybe there was the desire to uh, make these assessments of uh, fetuses or young children, uh, but there wasn't a technology. Now that's no longer true. Now it's cheap and early. So here's what you can do in an IVF clinic, which is biopsy a single cell on day four. And... That cell, because it's like all your cells in your body, in that future body, um, has the same genetic content. You can. This is where you can get a years of schooling polygenic score, day four, and so on. You, I mean, you can get everything that you can get as a thirty-year-old or as a fifty-year-old on day four. Yeah. You know, back to your, uh, the college where you said 14, 14 years of college. A person doesn't have to have. 14 years of college. He may have never gone to college, but his intellectual capacity is like a 14 year college it, person. Is that what you're saying? It's a prediction based on your A's and C's and T's and G's of how far you're going to go in school. If you went to school, you could be not going to school and still be educating yourself. That's right. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. And you're, you're predicting it's like 14 years. For, for an individual. And others, it would be 20 years, and other people would be 12. Totally right. But the point here is how early one can get this information. Again, technology years ago would have been uh, wait until the child is born. <laughs> now it's not. Um, so here's uh, an, an ad I found uh, a couple weeks ago of where, um, of, of where we are along. So, of course, I mean, everyone probably already knows that, you, that people do this regularly for genetic conditions. Like, that's... Um, typically done. So here's, so these have clinics in Los Angeles and New York and Texas, not yet, Mad, not yet Madison or, or Wisconsin more generally, but this, but their next service is eye color. Um, so, but the, the question, so the, but what this is describing in the, um, um, for those who don't, for those who don't know, there is essentially zero regulation on what can or cannot be um, ascertained from a fetus. So, you, like I said before, technological constraints used to be there, which is that maybe you really want to know what your baby's eye color was, but there's just no way to find out on a four, four day old fetus uh, embryo. Um, now, no longer true. Uh, now, the constraints are um, potential parents asking and paying for this information. And here's, and here's the um, a example of the first set. So, they, so this, this particular company does sex. They've done that for a while, and now they've added to the uh, annou yeah, announcing eye color. So it's a big, you know, hot thing. Here's our new thing, eye color. Was there a question? Yeah. Um, so as we advance this technology, is it possible that you could also change, like, the strength of their immune system or um, their IQ or athleticism? Yeah, so good question. So Ask me that again in Q&A because there's two parts to your question. One is about editing this information, which I have not talked about. This is only taking the information as given, as given and predicting based on that information. Okay, So let me come back with Q&A on the editing part because that's a little bit of a different story. This is just the, what can be done as of years ago um, on human embryos in terms of taking the A's and C's and T's and G's in a cell uh, and extracting the DNA and making a prediction on many things, but in here's eye color. And the point here is, uh, well, in IVF clinics more generally, it would be which of these embryos do you want? And uh, you know, norm 
uh, thanks. Uh, normally, um, in embryo selection, it would be about genetic risk. It would be screening out uh, embryos that had a high likelihood of dying or of uh, failure to implant or of having a, a genetic condition that might be deadly. So that, that's old news. The new version of this is, well, what else would we want to predict in embryo selection? Qu the word predict. I do. Not determine. Yep. So there could be embryos where you predict a certain color and it turns out not to be the case. Totally right. Okay. Yes. And for that, uh, percentage of error? For eye color, it's really, uh, for, for eye color, um, it'll depend on the parents um, how good the predictions are, um, or how, right, how good the accuracy is. But for eye color, it's very accurate. For IQ, less so, right? In the back, yep. No. Um, so the question was about CRISPR. CRISPR, I'll get to a little bit later, as a gene editing tool. This uh, is just useful, I think, to think about two different parts of the question here. One is, as given, there's DNA in people. Um, we can extract that and use it for prediction. And that's what all I'm going to be talking about for the first 45 minutes or so. And then CRISPR and other gene editing technology is you take the DNA and you change it. Okay, so I'm not talking about the changing part. I'm just taking taking it as given because this is actually the e this is actually really easy uh, to just take as given and predict. And for some, and just like what you said, for some conditions like sickle cell, very high accurate. Blue eyes, very highly accurate. Sex, very highly accurate. As you move down the compli the complication level of the outcome, like years of schooling, much less accurate. The question is, do we want it, that information to be given to? parents to use the selection, not whether it's 100% accurate, which is an important question, but, but that's, that's not but my, uh, the, policy, uh, the policy point I want to make is uh, right now there is zero policy around this. Do we want that to be the answer? Zero policy. And just let the market decide what parents want to know. And, and that's where we are right now. And so the future, and this is where, like, like I described in the book, uh, where we thought, oh, this is going to take years and years and years to develop. Here, I think it's a little clearer to us that the future is not that we're is tailing off where fewer and fewer people are getting their DNA tested. You know, the, the, quite the opposite. The data sets are amassing much uh, quicker than they were a few years ago. And there's um, incredible... Uh, and because of that, there's new outcomes to predict. There's uh, out, and 23andMe gives uh, pretty regular updates about the outcomes that they're predicting and giving you new information. And that's only going, it's only going to go further in that direction. And there's, uh, we haven't experienced the following thing yet, but that's, it's another important part of policy is, is to assume for a minute that 23andMe data gets hacked and publicly released, what safeguards would we like in place for that type of information? So right now the answer is there's no safeguards, um, except for employment and health insurance through the G GINA law, which is, those are the two places that cannot discriminate against you. So let me, let me uh, um, uh, wrap up by reminding us of a couple recent events that are related to privacy and discrimination. First, some, you know, a few years ago, 140 million customers got their credit reports hacked, right? And uh, more recently, Marriott had uh, 500 million guest information hacked. So the thing here to, uh, that I want to um, scare you in with is that the uh, information that was hacked in these previous accounts are names, social security numbers, credit card numbers, addresses, and if you go down that list, you'll you'll recognize that those those are a list of things that are you know highly private, and you don't want them released. But they are changeable, <laughs> and they're not very predictive of your Alzheimer's risk. Whereas uh, a hack for 23andMe uh, is the opposite; it's not changeable, and it is predictive of your Alzheimer's risk. Not not like you as a group, your Alzheimer's risk. The other part about privacy, this is from a paper in Science a few months ago, is who is, is caught up in this privacy question. You might think it's only people who's given their data to 23andMe. No, 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 it is not. 
uh, and this is related to a question that might come up about criminal justice in Q&A, about the finding of serial killers from cold cases. Same kind of genre here, which is, it's not that you need to be in the data set. If your third cousin is in the data set, that's how the serial killer was, uh, in, in, in Gold, the Golden State serial killer was caught. It wasn't the killer's uh, DNA in the data. It was his third cousin's DNA that was in the data. And that was able to uh, cast the net over, well, we know it was this person's third cousin. Find all the third cousins. It's got to be one of them, right? So similar thing here, which is that a data set, this is in the journal Science, a few months ago, a data set of about 1.3 million, not very large, a data set, they asked the question, um, how likely could we find somebody's cousin in this data set and, and, then fill, and then fill this out going forward? And that's the punchline. The technique that they, the algorithms that they, disc, that they um, produce in this paper uh, make the following suggestion, they could implicate, meaning find, nearly any U.S. individual of European descent in the near future. Like these data sets are of the size that it's everybody <laughs> in the U.S. Is, in, is implicated in the data set, not just the people that, were, that gave their own saliva sample. So it's not privacy as you know, an individual, it's everyone's privacy um, that's uh, at risk. And I'm going to skip through a couple of these employment things so we have more time. Um, and this is another, just another example that was recent when I put up here. Now it's a year old. Um, a DNA test for uh, 190 diseases for newborns. Um, and, and the point here is that it's essentially unregulated and it's outside the clinic. This is something that you deal directly with the company. It is for $649. And it it, di it it detects 190 diseases and health traits uh, without any clinical interaction. So let me broaden it back up. Policy, um, privacy. Who owns your contributed uh, genetic data? When you send it to 23andMe, you are now a part of a large research study, uh, and you, there's no getting out of it. Uh, is the short answer? Um, need that? Is that where we want it to be? Um, how do we weigh? And this is the just more general privacy question about this third cousin issue. If your sister contributes to 23andMe, and therefore you're in 23andMe, whose privacy are we weighing here when we're talking about biological family members, when one person can make the decision for their whole family of whether they're in the data set or not? Is this uh, you know, interesting kind of novel question about privacy in, the, in this context? Um, access and representation. Are these tests going to be covered by insurance? Maybe, maybe not. Um, another, this is going to take us uh, in a different direction momentarily, and I invite Q&A follow-up. Representation here, what I mean by that is um, two things. Uh, so in the whole world, there are something like 15% of the world's population are of European ancestry, give or take, if you let me some leeway on that number. Um, if you asked what proportion of all these GWAS, um, what proportion of the subjects are of European ancestry and all the GWAS findings that we have? Want to guess? Almost 90%. And the, and, and the answer for African ancestry is like 2%. So none of the findings are for anybody right now except for individuals of European ancestry. So. Think about that clinic again, your clinic interaction where you are an individual who is not of European ancestry and might be um, faced with a clinician making treatment choices for someone who's not you. So that's representation. Oh, the other uh, point is of all those European ancestry individuals in the data, what, what are the top three countries they're from? that represent like 80% of all the data themselves. I, I bet you're gonna get two of them. I wanna see if you can get all three. Not Germany. So Germany is an interesting case. Germany does not do this uh, to any. So you remember uh, German's history with. Uh, okay, so I won't have to go further there. Um, so Germany is actually on the very low end of anything about DNA and ancestry. Um, so let's let's start over. Three countries: U.S., U.K. are are two correct ones. What's the third? Australia. Australia. Nope. France. Nope. Not France. Canada. Not Canada. It's going to be, uh, uh, okay, so we're not, we're not getting closer, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, 
Iceland. Because all of them are in the data. Like everybody in Iceland is in one data set, so that makes it a powerful data set. So US, UK, and Iceland. How representative of the environments of the world are those three places? Not very. Um, discrimination, getting back to this uh, policy theme. Uh, what interactions between us and people who are not us do we want protected by law? And the answer right now that we've decided is there are two people, you know, two entities, health insurers and employers that cannot discriminate against us or face legal consequences. Everyone else on that list can. You can add colleges, you can add K through 12, preschools, et cetera. Everything else is on the list of do we want, do we want, these, do you want, want these institutions to uh, be able to discriminate for or against uh, you? Um, should, should we use genetics to make clinical decisions? Maybe we'll get back with that with Q&A, because um, I, I put that in quotes. This is what precision medicine is. You take genetics uh, information, and you make treatment decisions partly based on those. Um, and how do we feel about using that same? So if we like precision medicine, which my, ob, my uh, typical experience with crowds such as yourselves suggests a lot of enthusiasm for, for precision medicine. You've had your DNA genotype. Your clinician says, it, um, you know, you have this A right here in your genome that seems to usually do a, uh, people that have that seem to really respond well to treatment A. Most people say, yeah, I should, that sounds great. What about educational interventions? It'd be the same thing. Like, uh, you have these A's and T's and C's and G's. People who have those seem to really respond to this type of educational intervention. Now we're talking about young children instead of old adults, but nonetheless it's the same kind of issue. Do we want, you know, do we want protections or, or no protections? Um, and then finally, uh, on this, on this uh, side, um, in what ways would we like interactions to be protected or not protected between uh, p potential parents and clinicians in thinking about embryos and fetuses? about sharing information, genetic information. Do we want any guardrails on that? Right now the answer is no, zero guardrails um, on what types of information can be elicited. Do we want that to be non-zero? So that's another major policy question. Um, I'll just flag for the uh, audience that UW-Madison is like taking this seriously. We have, uh, we're currently hiring three people, three more people versus the people on this uh, in addition to the uh, four on this list who are really interested in this area of social genomics, you know, stay tuned. It's an investment from the university in really uh, building up this um, area of, of interest. I'll very uh, thankfully acknowledge all the funders I've had at the UW and around the, the U.S. And now officially open it up for the main Q&A. And thank you. Who determines the uh, definition in your field of a valid data set. I mean, is there, this is an analogy only, is there a licensing authority? Is there some, something like in the hospital business, that the commission, you know, is there some entity in your particular field of work that determines, you're just shaking your head, no, no, no. I'm anticipating the end of the question and the answer is gonna be no. All right. uh, now, there's a scientific standard. I think you're envisioning a case maybe where these private companies have proprietary ways of sequencing human DNA that only they know how to do it. But that's just, there's a standard protocol with low error. Um, it, so it's not the measurement anymore. The measurement is done very cheaply and very precisely of human uh, uh, sequence DNA, uh, of human sequencing, of human sequences. Um, so it's, it's not that that we should be worried about so much. There, there's very low error rate versus like any other kind of measurement we would take of somebody. John, you, you keep referring to data sets, which is great, but there's different, the way you measure sometimes determines a result. And, and that's what I'm getting at. No, that, that, that's a fair question. And there's not an, a sp one answer to your question because there would be some answers that would be the UK Biobank is a survey of 500,000 Brits and they filled out thousands of self-reported bits of information about their income, about their years of schooling, and also contributed a saliva sample. And by doing so, they're in one data set of survey outcomes with genetic information. That's one example. Another example would be 23andMe, which is not a representative sample. It's a collection of people who've paid to be part of research, um, and they've contributed their saliva, and some of them, many of them, have also uh, answered survey questions. 
part three. There could there are um, medically based consortia where they would where they would attach to your electronic health records um, genetic information. So that would be another data set. So there's not one answer. There's many answers to your question, but it's a great question. Hi, I wanted to make one um, point and also share a real life Wisconsin story. Um, the point was um, that 23andMe, if I remember correctly, is now owned by the ex-wife of the Amazon executive. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. So this is already like really market-based, it feels like. Um, but this year, on my health insurance, there was a question to go in and get extra screening um, basically an incentive plan. If you come in and you do this through UMR, it, it was a lot of money. You save about, I think it was $800 around that a year. But then as I went through the questions, so you go and you get the blood test, you could do these things. Then there was a little box that said, um, gives permission to share your genetic information with the company, I think it was like for two years. And it seemed really highly suspicious. Um, so I called the company and I said, well, I don't know if I consent to this. And they said, oh, well, you already checked the box. You can't withdraw your consent. And I hadn't filled it out all the way, but they're basically, it seemed to me, bribing people to give away permission to their genetic information. And maybe that was an over, uh, I don't know. I would be curious if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I mean, it's worse than that because I mean, when you do 23andMe, you pay for the privilege of contributing your DNA to a research study. Or you'll pay several hundred dollars. So it's not, I mean, so I don't have any, you're, you're right. Um, in the U.S., it's, a, it's um, I'm going to say close to impossible to withdraw your genetic data from a 23andMe company. It's not true in the EU. Like, they have different laws. Um, they have a law that if you ask 23andMe to uh, rid, to get you out of their data set, they must, or face legal consequences. So it's not that it couldn't be different. It is different in the, U in the EU. It's not different here. You are, it is uh, very difficult to get your uh, DNA out of these data sets once they're in. Um, and you're right. So in 23andMe has, has been a private company. Uh, I don't see them changing. But they're, but they're a mix because they get NIH money, uh, uh, National Institutes of Health money, to do some of these analyses because they're a health company too. They do the GWAS for um, their latest, one of their latest one is for diabetes. And they're, because their data set is 10 million people, th uh, they can have, they have a lot uh, more information than um, a single, like a UW Health or something that has, uh, does not have 10 million people who have been genotyped. Um, so 23andMe is a private company, will be a private company, but they're also dipping into uh, federal um, health uh, dollars, too. They, you have to get the mic uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I just have a question getting back to the third cousin situation. Is there um, a difference if you are half-siblings or if there are... Maybe by different, can you clarify what you mean matter. by difference? Well, I mean, because the the genetic material comes from both parents. So if one of those is, if it's the same parents for a couple of kids, and then a different, you know, one parent stays the same, and then the other parent changes somehow, um, can we feel a little more comfortable? <laughs> if we're from a broken home, perhaps? <laughs> Um, no, I mean the answer is no. Like you're, because uh, it, it you just need one person in your family who's biologically close to you for you to be in the data. It could it could very well be that we're comfortable with our sixth cousin in the data because that person has many many people who are also sixth cousins. Um, but you you know you as a person have many uh, have fewer sisters or half-sisters. So once that you're determined to be that level of closeness, it really narrows the range of who's possibly that person um, who's, who's not in the data. Um, and, but the, again, the direction is not to say that right now, there's no sense that right now every single person in the country of European ancestry is identifiable because of the data, because of the data sets. Um, the, the science paper said it was only 60% of the people in the country. Uh, so, but that's a, of a small data set. As the data set gets larger, it's just going to catch more of us in there as our, relative, as our biological relatives um, and their biological relatives uh, you know, contribute their information. 
I, I asked before about the four different companies and how they may do things differently. Um, and then I also wanted to ask about why do you think most people are doing this? Why, why would they be sending their information to these companies? Are they more likely to find, are they looking to find out their history of where they, their ancestors came from and that sort of thing more than their DNA? Yeah, I can't answer for everybody. I mean, you didn't ask for everybody, but and usually we, we kind of skipped over the first question I get asked, which is, did you send your information to 23andMe? Because the answer is yes, I did. Uh, uh, but I did a long time ago, like three years ago. Um, and, and why? I mean, but the answer is, uh, is going to differ for a lot of people. And, and this is where I should make a couple contrasts with the different uh, companies, uh, because people are interested in even after you know they've gone through the hour of scared of s scared straight that I've just there's still a lot of there's a lot of interest and for not not for bad reason, um, which is so 23andMe is the only let me let me just make a distinguish let me just distinguish 23andMe versus Ancestry DNA those are the two big ones there's some minor players that I but those aren't you're probably not going to use those um, Ancestry DNA is they're not going to ask you a lot of survey questions. They're not in the business of looking for trait predictions, health predictions. They are in the business of locating your ancestors because they take your DNA and they combine that with their catalog of genealogy, gene, genealogical information, and they map your family and where, the, where you've been and what year. So, it's, so ancestry DNA is really ancestry. And places, where, where, where was your lineage? 23andMe is a little bit of ancestry and uh, and how they are distinguished from ancestry DNA 23andMe is a little bit of ancestry they'll give you a prediction and then a lot of prediction predicting health information and traits by traits I mean like the asparagus thing which they will tell you um, but also health like Parkinson's risk so those are two different and you do not and I'll say one more thing uh, 23andMe they are they're moving in the direction very rapidly of uh, asking you over and over are you sure you want this information because they're moving into Parkinson's and more recently breast cancer and here are so they don't ask you so much about asparagus you know you're just kind of opted in to those kind of silly ones but for you know disease um, conditions like Parkinson's um, they ask you kind of over and over are you sure you want this information so they're you know they're uh, they're sensitive to the these uh, the, the fact that people might not want to know everything that they could tell you so I, I, I think that's basically your question thank you Recently, we've had a controversy in Wisconsin about rape test kit, uh, kits and the backlog of five years and whatever and how it's being resolved. Is, is technology doing the same thing uh, to that issue? In other words, cheaper, faster, private sector may be doing it? Oh, I, I, can't, I, I can't speak to that. The only thing, uh, you're, you're asking this a little bit more of a specific question, I think, about private companies getting in the game of um, rape kits, uh, the assays themselves. I, I, I can't speak to that. I, I thought where you were going was the extent to which cold cases are going to be solved. And old rape kits, in, in, in particular, will be useful because the data set, you know, if, if a rape or a murder that, that's 10 years old, if the, spec, if, if the biological sample was kept, the fact that the data sets have grown so much over time makes, makes the, this new, like a new analysis really productive. And there's been um, I, I, I used to be. I used to say dozens, but I think it's more like more than a hundred cold cases of rape and, and murder that have been have led to convic convic con new convictions um, just based on this type of um, you know you had a biological sample and now you're now you're going to, and in, in there's a third cousin <laughs> uh, in in the big data set of millions of people and that locates who the person you want to find is and the fact that these data sets are now of many millions of people means there's a lot of third cousins right so it's unlikely that it's, it's less and less likely to not find someone related to this old old biological sample from a rape or a murder or so on so i was just thinking that you know, you've got a, a crime lab it's government funded yeah five-year backlog and here you're showing us what the private sector is doing and getting in knowledge base and techniques and computer power is making this quicker and quicker yeah. for the law enforcement, something they could do at their local police station. 
Yeah, they could send these to 23andMe, right? And no, that, there's kind of a serious point there that, yeah, it's, it's really cheap to do this. It's not, the, you know, it's not the law enforcement that would be. It's just that the, the law enforcement part of this, they're not trying to do like polygenic score test uh, algorithms and so on. They just want to find, they want to locate someone who has similar DNA in the data set. And that's like pretty easy to do. It's just finding. I, I don't, I don't, oh, I, actually, I do know one more thing. Uh, there's the four companies I said at the beginning, one of them, the, the smallest one, family and family tree DNA, um, they have been in the news because they have said, we will um, proactively cooperate with the FBI and crime labs to uh, <laughs> to take our private samples and see what kind of uh, conviction, like what kind of matches we can find. The other companies I don't think have taken the same stance. You need a mic. You need a mic. Would an Asian... Wait, Tom. Um, so... My question is, is there any proposed legislation and, uh, you know, or regulation? And knowing how the sausage gets made, it's so difficult to get things through. Who are the major organizations that are lobbying for or against regulation? or, or <laughs> The against is the, is, is the thing, right? Um, so, I mean, my untrained uh, eye here is that you take GINA, the 2008 law about um, insure, health insurers and employers cannot discriminate or face legal consequences, and you add other things. Um, but what's the constituency? Um, it's not the private companies that, and you know, this is where they make their money. Um, so it, it's like it's you know us people who. But, but these aren't. It's, it, it has occurred to me with different discussions I've had over these uh, type of these type of discussions that. People are not of the same mind. Um, people will have different ideas about what, on the on the IVF side, what would be reasonable. What would you like to know? What would you know? And and, so, and on the criminal justice side, there's a weighing of of potentially solving fewer murders um, if you c uh, really put constraints on the use of DNA. Um, and in in schools and so on, you know, there, there's people could very if i told you that um that there's a very high that dyslexia for example might be highly genetically predicted um and that um it, maybe it might be useful to to have those predictions in mind as a child goes to preschool or kindergarten some people would be swayed by maybe we should use that information in educational settings um what about autism adhd things that have you know things that you that we might be able, that we might diagnose quote unquote too late um through our current diagnoses uh strategies of of, of um, asking parents and children and, and teachers um so there's I'm just outlining some, uh, dis those are some summaries of discussions I've had which suggest to me that there's not, we're not of one mind of, e of what we would actually want to do. I think this, this, this what I'm describing is some um, possible places we might want to think more. Um, so I was going to ask, um, do you think that any of the companies that you've mentioned would actually be trustworthy with the data because there are no regulations? And secondly, do you think there are, I know you're here to like teach more people about these social um, implications, and do you think that in the near future there would be enough people to actually make a difference and try to propose a law or regulation? Great questions. Um, so the first one is about uh, private companies and what they're going to do with the data. Um, and trust. Uh, you know, th th they have some incentives not to do terrible things with your data, you as customers, uh, right? Um, so there's that might uh, put some guardrails here. But but they would be unofficial, right, versus the the GINA Act, which is officially health insurers and employers cannot do the following things. So um, 
you know, I think it's a, these are good questions that I won't have the answer to. It's a, people, and people in the audience would have different answers themselves about the level of trust we would have for these private companies or the government for that matter. Um, uh, and the second part about the social implications and getting people together to, uh, for action is really the, first, is really the, the, the point that uh, was right before you, which is what are the next steps? Who are the people who are um, thinking about it? And um, this is vi this. I hope you. I hope I was able to get across a, a main point of how quickly these are these things are moving, um, and that in itself, I think, means that we are behind. In in and it could be that it could be that our answer is we like the way it is, <laughs> and we're we're okay with the direction it's going. But we haven't kind of officially had that answer. We haven't. You know, there's not been a vote that says uh, we have this answer. Um, so and and then there's a whole another lane, and maybe I'll, just, I'll bring this up. Um, before someone else does, which is gene editing is, is also really is in the news and it's 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 gotten a lot more policy attention. Um, it, it's interesting. I mean, the policies um, have shifted uh, rapidly, which is a few years ago, the answer was never on human embryos and never will the federal government give any money for gene editing of human embryos. That was like a couple of years ago. Now, uh, yes, human embryos, and yes, the government will fund our federal government will fund this if the embryos are not viable. Um, so that's been something that's changed over the last year. Um, and I'll point out this other issue that the U.S. law um, is not the world law; uh, it does not govern every country. And other countries, some other countries are very proactive at both gene editing and the polygenic scoring that I've been describing and amassing even larger data sets, um, especially enrolling uh, high IQ, individuals with very high IQ uh, in the case of China um, to really push hard on these issues. And you know, the government is not, the US government does not have oversight there. I know, uh, I know that uh, 23 and B. if you have your genome done by them, they will give you a list of people who, uh, who you, uh, your genomes are closely matched mm -hmm. and what percent uh, the genome matches. Now, does that mean those people are just in their data bank or mm -hmm. do these private companies share data with each other or with the government or vice versa? I've answered you. So those are the answers. Uh, they're only so when 23andMe gives you your relatives, those are within their data. And so what? And and and, and secondly, they do not share between the different companies or with government. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. They're 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 in a race right now of who's going to get, who's going to be the one data set that wins over all other data sets. Um, and those f four companies are trying to. Uh, you know, even provide free testing just to get there because, uh, um, like some like Twitter or Facebook, there's only one of them, and and uh, and, ha and being the, the one, the big data set is is all that matters. And so these four companies are really competing against each other and will not be sharing information unless they join forces against the other one. Right? That's the only way they would uh, uh, do that because their their whole. Um, um, asset these companies is their data. It's not the technology. Everyone has the same technology. Everyone has the same statistical tools. It's only the the amount of data they have, the number of people that they've genotyped. Actually, we do have time for one more if there's another question. Anybody else? Okay, kind of going back to to the beginning of your presentation a little bit where you're talking about the the genome and things are being added every day and it's going really fast. Mm -hmm. So here's my question. I did get my 23andMe done during Thanksgiving of 2017. <laughs> so because of how fast they're moving and they're adding more and more and more, and, and I'm assuming you mean new, they're finding new genes and new gene SNPs, mm -hmm. correct? So my raw data from 23andMe in 2017, if I got 23andMe now in 2019, Same. is my raw data different? No. 
That raw data? Basically, no. The I mean, raw data never changes? Uh, if you had this test done when you're an embryo, if you had this right, test... Right, but if they find a new gene SNP, so what, what's what the new the newness here will come in a couple different varieties. You can have new relatives, not because they were born, but because they were they were included in the data set. Right, mm-hmm. that's where you get a new relative for twenty three and Me. Likewise, you can get a new f- genetic finding because they've gotten the data set that's big enough to find something new that they couldn't have found before. So if 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 I'm running my raw data through something like mm, Stratagene or Cotagen or whatever, as they evolve, I can go back and and I'll get a new health report and something new might be on my my new health report that wasn't on it a year ago. They're adding traits. Um, yes, like you know, that. every so diabetes is is relatively new. Something that was not there before it now is. So they're adding out- outcomes or traits or phenotypes. The, the precision of the findings is is uh, increasing because they are getting more people and they're doing more surveying, um, and you're getting new relatives because more people are in there. But your A's and C's and T's and G's to answer your question are the same. Okay, great, wonderful. Jason, thank you so much for such a lively, wonderful conversation tonight. Thank you.